we will turn to our reading, which is Colossians chapter 3. And that's on page 1184, if you have a church Bible. Of course, yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Page 1184, or Colossians chapter 3. It's towards the end of the New Testament, for those of you that don't have a church Bible. Um, And we're going to read from verse 15 uh, through to verse 1 of chapter 4. So Colossians 3, starting at verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since... As members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence of the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. As we come to God's word, let's uh, pray together, shall we? Let's pray. Father, we've just read that we should let the message of Christ dwell among us uh, richly as we teach and admonish one another. Father, we thank you for the message of Christ, your word, the Bible, the scriptures that you've given us, your living word. And we pray this morning that we would be those who would welcome Uh, your word into our hearts and that it would change us and make us more like the Lord Jesus, willing to serve the Lord Jesus for his sake. Amen. We do keep uh, that passage open uh, in Colossians chapter 3 into chapter 4. Now in the middle of um, the, the European Championships, I think you'll forgive me Uh, for a football analogy. Uh, I'm not going to talk about England or Scotland. That was pretty dismal. Uh, But what about Wales? Their their victory over Turkey, that was brilliant, wasn't it? And their passion for playing. You can see this in some of the pictures, in the the, the expression. They have a real passion for playing for their uh, country. Now, I do know, of course, that football in general is driven by money. Uh, But when you're playing for your country, there's so often some kind of different motivation that that, that kicks in. Look look at this picture of uh, Connor Roberts. I've never heard of Connor Connor Roberts. I I don't know how good he is or anything, uh, but he's certainly much better when he's playing for Wales. He's holding the badge here after scoring that goal in that game uh, against Turkey. This is so much more uh, than about personal achievement. It's about serving the team. And it's all about uh, the country that he loves and represents. Now, I've called this talk Serving uh, Jesus 24-7 because uh, what it means to be a Christian, I think, is so often misunderstood. For a lot of people, of course, it's about our upbringing, our background, what we do perhaps on Sundays, saying a prayer when things are particularly desperate, attending maybe church services, Uh, Or it's just a ticket to heaven when we die. Now, if you have been following our series in this part of the Bible these last few weeks, you should be uh, clear by now that genuine, biblical, saving Christianity is nothing like those things. 
genuine Christian faith is all about uh, Jesus, all about Christ is the title we've given to this uh, series. And if you're wondering why the picture of the lion, well in the Bible, uh, the Lord Jesus is described at times as the lion of Judah. It doesn't come up in, in Colossians, so it's not a perfect picture, I appreciate. Uh, and, and don't always imagine Jesus as a lion, that's probably not that helpful. Well, more to, be, to be more precise, uh, it is all about Jesus, but it's all about being in Christ. And that's a term that's come up several times as we've been looking through this letter. This letter that was sent initially to a group of believers, perhaps not that many of them, uh, in ancient Colossae, uh, ironically, in part of what is now Turkey. And Christianity is not primarily about what we do. It must come from the heart. And we see that expression, I think, four times in the passage that we've just read together. So if you'd have a look, verse 15, for example, says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Verse 16, straight after that, talks about singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. And then uh, through to verse 22, it call, talk, calls us to obedience, but with sincerity of heart. And then verse 23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. This is, uh, this is a heartfelt thing. It's a passionate thing. Following uh, Jesus is something that Christians want to do. It's not something that we just have to do. So if you're uh, with us this morning uh, and you, you don't know anything of this uh, inner desire to serve and to honor Jesus, then... Uh, let me say this lovingly, you're probably not a Christian yet, but, but you're in a good place. Don't give up, keep looking. Uh, Christian faith is not a burden. It's not a, a kind of guilt trip. It's not about ticking boxes or, or following rules. It's about living life to the full. That's what Jesus himself uh, said once. It's about this relationship of love and peace with the creator of the universe. And it all starts inside. It all starts in the heart. Just like these uh, Welsh players, when they put on their national colours, when they put on their uh, Welsh strip, our identity comes from being immersed in Jesus. Now you may remember last time we were looking at this a couple of weeks ago, uh, it talks here in verse 10 of chapter 3 of putting on a new self which is being renewed in the knowledge or in knowledge in the image of its creator so we kind of take off the shirt of this world and we put on the shirt of Jesus Christ chapter 3 verse 1 says since then you have been raised with Christ it says set your hearts your hearts again on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. It's when we uh, put our trust in the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. It's when we have that sorrow in our hearts for the way that we've treated God. It's when we uh, recognize that Jesus is God in human flesh and ask him for forgiveness. That's when the Spirit enters our hearts and begins to change us. It's then that we are raised with Christ and we take on this new identity as chapter 3 verse 12 describes it as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. That is when, by faith, we join, as it were, Team Jesus and we start living, playing for him. Well, that is what's happened to this, uh, say, small band of believers in uh, Colossae a few years, uh, only a few years after Jesus himself had lived and died uh, and, of course, lived again uh, here on this earth. These things, they really did happen. And this message, this good news of Jesus has been changing the world ever since. That's not an exaggeration. But, but how, does that, how does that all work? Well, when we recognize the new identity that we have in Christ, we start getting rid of the selfish, harmful stuff that we read about last time in verses 5 to 9 of chapter 3, and we start clothing ourselves, as verse 12 says, with compassion, kindness, humility, 
gentleness, patience. We start uh, forgiving others as the Lord forgave us. And over all these things, verse 14 says, we put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Doesn't that, as a, as a picture, doesn't it sound amazing? Just imagine if the world was uh, filled with people that lived and thought like that. Imagine if all Christians lived like that. It, it, it really is, quite, quite literally, a, a picture of heaven on earth. Uh, and that is the goal. It might sound a bit impossible, perhaps. But that is what God wants. It's what, of course, the world needs. We've just prayed for a few situations uh, around the world. Imagine if some of this entered into some of those uh, situations. What a difference it would make. Imagine if Caterham, let's just stick with Caterham for a moment. Imagine if that was filled with people like this. Imagine if you and me were like this all the time. As I say, it can sound impossible. Some of us have been Christians for quite a long time uh, and we really struggle with these things. They don't all come uh, naturally. But it's here in God's Word because it's not impossible. If you just think for a moment of the Welsh football team, uh, they are far more than the sum of their parts. Without being uh, rude, some of them are not that brilliant, actually. But on our own, we are, we are, we are totally helpless, or hopeless, I should say, uh, to coin a recent phrase. Uh, but in Christ, everything is possible. I mean, maybe this kind of picture might, might help a little bit. A uh, hundred years ago, no one would ever have dreamt of going, or the possibility of going uh, to the moon. But of course, now it is possible, not for every one of us necessarily, uh, but it is possible, but there's only one way, of course, that you can get there, and it is in a rocket. And what we need to get our heads around again is the fact that in Christ, when we are in Christ, we have access to power that leaves any uh, spaceship for dust. That is the kind of power that we have access to. And that is what we need to begin to understand. And that is why, of course, we uh, teach the Bible. It's why we uh, sing. Verse 16 in our reading says, uh, let the message, I've just prayed about this, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And this is one of, uh, I think, three key instructions that I want to bring out of our passage uh, for us this morning. Living in Christ 24-7 uh, means welcoming the message of Christ. And, and this is so, so important because God uh, reveals himself through, through the Bible. It's in the Bible uh, that we have the message of Christ. This is the message of Christ. It's the living word of God. And it's in here that we discover his love. It's in here that we discover his compassion, his faithfulness, his, his plans, his uh, promises. I mean, trying to uh, be a Christian without the message of Christ is like, I don't know, trying to... Uh, live without eating. You might think, well, I could do that perhaps for a few days, maybe even possibly a few weeks, but if you do not eat, you're going to die. It's the same with the message of Christ. And when we accept God's forgiveness, when we become believers, uh, it means welcoming his word. Let it, it says here, dwell richly in us. Uh, that means certainly individually, but of course, as a congregation of God's people, it's all about this message of Christ. Now, if you do find this uh, football analogy helpful, it's perhaps like listening intently to the manager's uh, instructions and to his uh, tactics, N not just because you have to, but because you absolutely want the best for the team. Only, of course, it is much much more than that. This, uh, this, this picture of uh, his message dwelling 
in us. It, it goes back into the Old Testament, actually. It talks about really the, the, the temple in Jerusalem that was once filled with the very Spirit of God. And what it's saying here is that when we have this heartfelt desire for the glory of Jesus, we will want his message to, to fill us. And it's then, it's when we allow his word to take over you know, every corner of our hearts, every corner of our uh, minds, that these other desires, the kind of bad stuff that we read about last time, we talked about last time, it's that that will kind of push those things out of our hearts when we fill our hearts with the message of Christ. Those things then automatically get pushed out. And of course, this does include the parts of God's word that we might feel a little bit less comfortable with. Uh, not only the, the, the things that we perhaps like and, uh, and enjoy, but actually there's parts of God's word at times, and we're going to come, come along, along to one, of the, one or two of those things perhaps in a few moments, uh, that you might feel, actually, I'm, I'm not sure I, I like that quite so much. You're not, so, not sure that it, it fits in with our culture and society in quite the way that I think it should. Well, if we're going to receive any of the message of Christ, we've got to receive all of it. And when we do that, it will cause our hearts to sing. I think some of us know this experience. When we have this message of Christ coming into us, our hearts just want to sing. Our voices, of course, have been given to us. They are uh, an amazing gift. Uh, the Bible says in the book of James, I think some of you are studying this in your home groups at the moment, chapter 3, verse 9, uh, about the tongue, that we can uh, praise God with it, but also we use it badly, of course, to curse God others. How can we do both of those things? Of course, our tongues are, are meant for that former thing of praising God, but so often we misuse it for the latter. Well, when we truly let the message of Christ dwell amongst us richly as we teach and admonish one another, as, as we all should, we all have this responsibility of teaching and admonishing one another. It's certainly not just my job. When we do those things, we will automatically want to burst into songs, psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. Now, of course, I, I, I recognize that singing is one of those things that we've just missed so much this last year or so. And it's because of this, because by the, God, the Spirit of God, we just want to burst out in song. Well, maybe it won't be too much longer uh, now, I understand even the last 24 hours that the Welsh government has begun to allow people to sing through their masks. So uh, that's great news, but I'm not sure it applies to us, sadly, quite yet. Well, God uses these songs, uh, songs that are filled with uh, the truth of his word. He uses them to fill us as part of uh, his uh, the things that he's given us to uh, fill us with this message of Christ uh, while at the same time, of course, uh, we bring praise to Christ as we sing and we bring joy to our hearts. Well, we must move on. Uh, the second kind of key instruction that, that, that comes out of this passage actually is in the previous uh, verse, and it's this, submitting to the peace of Christ. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace and be uh, thankful. Now this is so obvious really uh, and yet we find it so hard. I mean surely we, we don't really need telling do we that uh, having the, 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 the peacing, peace of Christ in our hearts is a good thing. I, I sort of wonder, you, know, you look at this and say well why do we have to be told to let it rule in our hearts? As, as if that's a difficult thing. Well of course it, it isn't always straightforward because it calls us as individuals uh, towards recognizing that we are part of something bigger something called community something called uh, church that that followers of Jesus are now uh, bound to we are tied up together in this we're not our own anymore we're part of something new the body of Christ and that really, again, is an amazingly good thing. 
Being part of that means that we have that unity. We're all uh, pulling in the same direction. We're now uh, at peace with God. And if we are at peace with God, we can then, uh, or how can we not foster uh, the, 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 uh, the things of God in our hearts and in our relationships? So often uh, we uh, strive for personal recognition, personal credit, uh, uh, personal gain. But now we should be looking for the benefit of the team, uh, looking for the benefit of uh, one another. How can we possibly be in conflict with brothers and sisters when we are at peace with God? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about this a body that believers are now part of. Uh, we're all still different, of course, but it uses these pictures of one being like an eye, one being like an ear, one being like a foot... Uh, each having different purposes, but all being part of the same body. And of course, in the same body, the foot doesn't attack the eye, the uh, ear doesn't fall out with the, with the foot. Well, it's God's vision that we all live as one body, the one body which in reality we are. And, and the beauty of this is that when we uh, play as a team, we get much more, we achieve much more than we can as uh, individuals. When we play as individuals, we all end up suffering. But when we play together as a team, we care for one another's needs. And of course, when that's the case, there's no room for gossip. There's no room for bitterness. There's no room from, for sniping from the uh, sidelines. There is only room for love, which, as verse 14 says, binds us all together in perfect unity. Well, that all leads us on to uh, this potentially more controversial uh, instructions from, eight, from verse 18, which I think I'm going to call serving uh, the Lordship of Christ. Serving the Lordship of Christ. Now, I'm sure you've already noticed from these one or two examples that we've already given that following Christ is not meant to be arduous. These are not arduous uh, rules. They are principles which are so obviously for our good. Welcoming the message of Christ, that's for our good. Submitting to the peace of Christ, that is for our good. Well, serving the Lordship of Christ is also very much for our good. And it's here that we kind of move out of what we might call the church sphere uh, and into the maybe 24-7 kind of sphere of life. Verse 17 says, Whatever, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father uh, through him. And then verse 24, it says, and this is such a helpful reminder, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. And that's where, what we need to keep in mind when we look at these three examples, and they are just examples that we're given uh, in this passage. Two of them relate to uh, relationships at home, uh, and one relating to the workplace. And, and as we look at these details, it's worth remembering uh, and keeping in our minds that uh, in these examples of the kind of households that would have existed uh, in this Greco-Roman Empire uh, situation at that time. So, for example, slavery was pretty much the norm, uh, where husbands routinely abused their wives, where fathers generally uh, respected their sons only when they became adults and rarely respected their daughters. Now, that's the context that this is uh, written into. Now, God's word never never condones slavery. Abuse and injustice attract God's anger and his condemnation. But of course the Bible is realistic. It deals with real issues and it gives us a practical guide for this messed up world that we live in. And it also recognizes that whilst we're all equal in Christ, we're not all the same. This, is, of course, is a source of such confusion in the world at the moment. There is a created order which God has given, which goes right back to the beginning, right back to the beginning of the Bible, in the book of 
Genesis, where, to pick up these examples, children are, it's clear that children are under the authority of their parents. Husbands and wives have complementary roles, but not the same roles all the time. I mean, an obvious one, of course, is childbirth. And in any society, workers clearly have to be organized. So you will get managers, you will get employers, and you will have employees. All of those things, they reflect God's created order. And if these principles were followed perfectly and wholeheartedly by all, well, the world would then be a perfect place. Well, we've heard already, haven't we, a little bit from uh, Paddy uh, about parents and children. Uh, and the instruction to fathers here is a bit of a kick up the backside, isn't it? To any chauvinistic man who thinks that bringing up children is the role of the mother. Of course, that's not true. Absolutely not. It's a partnership. Uh, and children. Uh, obviously, on another day, we'd have had a lot more children amongst us this morning. We've still got uh, one or two. If you're watching at home as well, and if at a certain point your parents tell you that you've been watching, not this morning, of course, not, not too much television this morning. You can watch the whole service, whatever they say. Uh, but normally, uh, if you're watching television or watching something on your screens and they say that that's enough, then that is enough. If they say that that is enough, that is time to stop. And when later on they tell you that it's time for bed, well, that is the time for bed. And now I'm not saying, of course, that they're always right in these things. That's actually not the point. I'm saying that Jesus has given your parents that authority. And if you love Jesus, you will want to obey them, even and I know from being a child myself, not that many years ago, even if you disagree with them. Now, in all of this, this of course, we do have to remember that uh, these are principles. There will be exceptions. So if, for example, your father, heaven forbid, uh, tells you to hurt somebody, then you don't have to do that because that's not what God wants you to do. And wives do not have to submit themselves to abusive husbands. But if you're a wife and you think your husband is wrong in something, and often we are, or perhaps you think they're unwise, or maybe they're not listening to you as if you think they should do, well, it might be in those circumstances that Jesus still wants you to submit to them. Because it says here, it is fitting in the Lord. Now, Ephesians 5, some of you will be uh, familiar with. That's a kind of parallel passage to this one. And, and there it gives you a bit more detail uh, about the relationship between husbands and wives. And it tells the, the husbands, uh, as well as the wives, of the need to submit to one another. It's not just a one-way thing. Uh, Philippians 2, in a more general sense, of course, tells all believers that we are to consider the needs of others above those of ourselves. So us husbands, it's clear here, are to love our wives as Christ loved us. That's what it says in Ephesians. And think about that. How much does Jesus love us? Well, of course, he laid down his life for us. Jesus is our Lord, but he loves us unconditionally, and of course, he's never harsh with us. So as I you know, read this passage, I have to say sorry to my wife for my shortcomings and to seek her forgiveness. And what about those of us who are managers? Chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Now imagine a world, again, in which that always happened. There would be no fat cats earning millions at the expense of their staff on the minimal wage. But it's not the world that we live in. But if you are a manager or you are an employer, are you treating your staff rightly? Are you treating them fairly? Remember how your master in heaven treats you you. 
And then what about Christian staff, employees? What is uh, our role? Well, it says to serve your earthly masters in everything. And by that it's clear it's not just uh, your Christian masters, it's not just those that are nice to you, uh, it's not just when they can see you, it's not just to make them like you or to give you a bigger bonus. It says here, but with sincerity of heart and reverence to the Lord, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working to the Lord, not for human masters. Imagine a workplace where that happened. How is that even possible? Well, verse 24 says, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. If you've got a a manager or a a boss who really is not fair, try and get that picture out of your mind and remember it's the Lord Jesus that you're serving. It says here, verse 25, anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs and there is no uh, favoritism. So this is saying that we don't need to uh, pursue earthly rewards because we are guaranteed something far, far better in heaven. If Jesus is our master, uh, we don't need to worry so much about this boss that doesn't care less about us. And ultimately, Jesus says here that he will bring justice to every person and every situation. So if you are being uh, treated unfairly, there will be justice, ultimately. Jesus does not have favorites. And of course, as I've said before, we have this resurrection power of Christ dwelling in us richly. We have this peace of Christ ruling in our hearts. It is possible to live like this. We're in Christ. Now, of course, as I say those things, I recognize that each of us falls regularly, maybe even every day. We are forgiven for those things in Christ. We don't need to let those failures get us down. Just look forward. Strive with the power that he has promised us for the future. We have that unconditional love that he promises us. Well, I appreciate that's just a very uh, quick overview of these vital things. Maybe in future weeks, you might find the opportunity, even within your home groups, Uh, to discuss how some of these things uh, apply to you in your personal, individual circumstances. Uh, Do pray for one another as you seek to put these principles into practice. Maybe even if you have the opportunity to confess uh, mistakes and challenges. We are the body of Christ, remember. We're here to uh, support one another, not to condemn one another. Now, I want us to close where we uh, started I remember that these are not black and white rules. They are amazingly positive, but countercultural, uh, very often, countercultural principles. They are impossible to follow without the heart of Christ. So remember those uh, Welsh footballers. Individually, some of them are, as I say, not that brilliant. But when they come together as a team, when they put that shirt on, that badge on, they are transformed. And and that is a very imperfect illustration of the perfect thing that God can do with us when we welcome his message, when we let his peace rule in our hearts, and when we remember that it is the Lord Christ whom we are serving. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your message. We thank you for your peace. We thank you for the Lordship of the Lord Jesus, which is good for all of us. And like any team, we recognize, Father, that we need management, we need guidance, we need oversight. And what an amazing thing it is to have you as our manager. So help us, we pray, to listen to what you have to say to us. Help us to give our hearts to your work. Help us to obey. Help us to put in practice these things, to consider how they apply to us uh, individually and as a church, even when it's hard, even when we struggle even to agree with them, because it is you we are serving. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.